So I, I, have, I have a little bit of reputation, a repetition in the um, presentation I created related to some of the other stuff we've heard today. So I'll, I might breeze through some things just as reinforcers rather than spend as much time on them, and then we might have more time for questions. Um, I'm privileged to be here. Thanks so much for asking me. Uh, my uh, expertise in working with people with learning differences grew out of a um, uh, a, a project working with youth transitioning from pediatric to adult services. And when we started that program, Kayak, we built it and didn't know who would come. Um, and the folks who come um, almost exclusively have significant neurocognitive um, uh, disabilities and learning differences. And therefore, we've met a few thousand families and learned a lot from those families. Um, so uh, today, what I want to talk about is how stress manifests itself in many different ways in people's lives, and how stress um, can be attributed to many different sources in people's lives. And it is my experience that, that changes in individuals' behavior are not commonly due to a simple answer, but commonly due to a combination of many things of which maybe this issue is 20% of the problem, and this issue is another 20% of the problem, and this issue is the third 20% of the problem. And we might be able to make it better by 60% rather than think we're going to solve the problem. And so I, I want us to start with that kind of frame of reference. None of us have stress-free lives. And we're not going to create a stress-free world for people we're caregivers for. So we have to encounter stress in the world. Um, it's going to manifest in different ways. We can minimize. Um, we can improve our own resiliency towards stress. But we're not going to make the world a perfect place. If anyone has the um, magic wand to do that, please use it right now. Um, but I don't think any of us do, right? So, so that's the frame I'm coming from as I talk. And then we're going to talk about, so, so let's start with, why do babies cry? There's 20 reasons. Why do babies cry? They're wet, hungry, want attention, teething, hurting, sick, cold, hot, tired. There, something hurts. So lots of reasons why babies cry. Why do toddlers have meltdowns? Spoiled, so a, a reinforced behavior is another way to say spoiled, OK? Unable to communicate a frustration that they have, or a need that they have, or a desire that they have, OK? They want something. Do toddlers have meltdowns when they're off their game for other reasons, because they're ill, because they didn't have a nap today, because they slept bad last night? When they're hungry? When there's something in the room that's sensorily irritating them? Somebody else is screaming? So there's lots of different reasons why all of us have stress and express it in ways that look like crying in infants and meltdowns in toddlers. So let's think about, I'm going to actually, well, this is just a reinforcer slide. You all heard this already. If all behavior is communication, then we have to think about it in the video clip of what happened before, what happened during, what happened after. But individuals in particular who have, as they grow into adult life, who have less of an ability to express verbal complex thoughts are going to have moments when they have stress and whatever their equivalent of meltdown is. My meltdown might be crying in my pillow. Your meltdown might be something different than that, right? But we all have it in different ways. I'm going to let you just read this, because I don't want to pretend that what we're going to talk about in any of the sessions today are magical. And I, and I think this parent just sums it up in an interesting way. Maybe I will read it aloud for people um, for whom that's not easy. Um, before Lindsay had speech, we could only guess at what was causing her pain. It was awful to feel, feel so powerless in helping one's own child. And when she was aggressive or hurting herself, there was no way I could just sit back and take time to figure out what was causing it. I had to intervene right away by moving away from her or restraining her arms. 
But then once we learned to see her behavior as her forms of communication, we began to understand more about purpose. And then we could begin to really focus on strengthening the communication skills she had. And her problem behaviors did become less and less frequent, and she did expand in her language. And I want you to just read this as saying, there isn't a switch. We're all in this process, right? And so thinking about, you can't do it right every time. So we just talked about how important consistency is. And how many of us are capable of 100% consistency? None. Right? So we have to all give ourselves the, the break of, of recognizing that this is a process, that going for improvements is, it takes time, that, um, uh, that understanding or looking for understanding helps. That's the themes I see in what this parent said. So what do we need in life? Food, sleep, we need physical comfort. Pain, pain will always get in the way, right? We need physical conditioning. And I wanted to talk about that as an as a issue in terms of all of us managing our stress. Because if we're what I'll call fit or in good shape, we handle everything better. We feel better. We experience pain less. Same pain in a person who's in shape and has been doing things to stay well, getting enough sleep, doing the exercise, the things that are impossible to do but we must do to feel our best so that we can have our oxygen on to help the person next to us. We have to think about that physical conditioning for ourselves as caregivers, but also for the person that we're providing care for. If that person's a couch potato and never uses their body, their body doesn't feel as good. If that person doesn't sleep, their body doesn't feel good. So, so these are the very basic Maslow hierarchy needs that we all have, right? We all need food, shelter, sleep, physical conditioning, and, and the absence of pain or the, or, or the presence of comfort. And then I like to sum up everything else we need in love and limits. So we need attention. We need social interaction. We need to communicate as humans. We need to have a sense of ourself or a sense of freedom of, or control over ourselves, not complete control by others. And this is an important point when I work mostly with people in teenage years and young adulthood, because it's very hard to um, think of your child as yet not yet ready to be what your vision of adulthood is, but yet that person is still an adult, and it looks different. And you, we sometimes get stuck with using the language, but he thinks like a three-year-old, so I should treat him like a three-year-old. And I want us all to take a big breath about that, because in fact, that doesn't always get us where we want to go. That adult human needs to be an adult human. Maybe they have learning differences and they approach the world differently, but they're not, they don't respond to being treated well, generally, to being treated like a three-year-old. And so I, I'm not saying any of that to chastise any of us, but we get trapped in that because some people use that language, right? His functional level is si age six, but his emotional level isn't an age six. His social level isn't age six. His experiential level isn't six years of life. And that's different. So I think we have to think differently when we think about what a person needs in the various life stages of life. And then, and, and I throw in as the caveat there, then, then as an adult, well, throughout our lives, we're all also sexual beings. And how does that fit into a need that people have in adult life? And I'm not going to talk about that ex really at all anymore for the rest of the talk. But just in thinking about all of these different kinds of needs we have as humans, um, everyone has these needs dis despite what their learning differences are. So what are signs of stress in you? You kind of talked about what triggers your stress already, but what happens to you when you're stressed? I can never have a talk where I don't talk about toileting, so, um, uh, so when I get stressed, I run to the bathroom. It goes right to my colon, man. That's where it goes. Um, you might get a headache. You might have sleep disruption. You might drink too much wine. Um, you might um, uh, have chest pain or feel lousy. Um, feel your heart racing. Like those are all the different ways people feel stress, right? Um, uh, challenging behaviors. I'm going to leave as another whole group of this. It's a response to stress, and it's a term we tend to uh, tend to use only ex only in the world of intellectual disability. 
But you know, we all demonstrate challenging behaviors sometimes, right? Has anybody ever thrown anything? Has anybody ever kicked anything? Has anybody ever screamed at anybody? I have four children. They were all teenagers at the same time. I majored in screaming for about six years. Um, and so, so I think we want to be careful about just using that term as a term that's exclusive for people who have learning differences. So then how do you manage your stress? You all worked on some ideas related to how you manage your stress. And I like to think about the way I manage stress or the way I help people think about how they manage stress is, what can you do right in the moment? What can you do if you have a little bit of time or can separate yourself? Because sometimes we can't separate ourselves, right? It's nice if you could always, but you know, in the middle of a physical exam on a patient, if I'm stressed, like it's hard for me to excuse myself and come back later. Um, uh, so something in the moment, something if you have a little more time, and then something that's preventative. That's the way I think about them. And I think about all of them as habits. So is it the best time to practice your relaxation strategy when your stress is at a level of 10? No, because then it's harder to do it because you're already standing in a pressure cooker or whatever your metaphor of, of what stress feels like, right? So, so let's think about things you could do right in the moment. What do people do right in the moment to relax? A deep breathing is the most common, right? Anybody have anything else they use? And say, prayer. prayer. Anybody have anything else they use? Stretch. Stretch. Sometimes you can do that again. If I stood and did, did that in the middle of doing a, a do if I did that in the middle of somebody's physical exam, they might be a little off put by me. Um, uh, um, I'll try it once and see how it goes. Um, uh, what else? Um, say, counting. counting. So some some mental exercise, right? Some people use a kind of meditative chant, you know, a phrase, a mantra, if you will. Um, other you people might use positive imagery, just pulling up your favorite picture. So if you're going to do any of these things, what I want you to do is think about which one you want to either try anew to practice more of or try a new one. And I want you to actually create the exercise for yourself of practicing it when you're fine, not when you're stressed. Because you, how many times do you think you have to do something for it to be a habit? Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. I don't, I don't actually know the answer, so you should be careful when you're talking at a podium about asking a question you don't know the answer to. But, um, uh, but in fact, it takes a lot of times, right? So some people say you, can make, you, can, you can't break a habit in a week. It might take you more like six weeks. So I don't know how many times you have to do it, but it needs to be repeated enough that it becomes a pattern of behavior that you can readily call up. And so if we just teach someone to do three deep breaths but never practice it, expecting when they're in the middle of a meltdown that it's, it's time to do your three deep breaths now, doesn't work for any of us. So I think it becomes interesting to think about how can we practice some new habits for ourselves and how can we practice them as a family together? Because we're going to try to start imprinting a habit that we're all going to use. Um, in particular, for screaming, I like to use a timeout, right? And everybody knows timeout. We talked about this already. But, um, but I like to be able to encourage families that anyone in the room can call a timeout when somebody's screaming. So if I'm screaming at you because it's the 87th time I've asked you to do things and you know my voice has escalated by that point, um, you can say, do you need a timeout? To me. And that, that's an interesting uh, role modeling in your home. And it, it's an interesting vulnerability to create for yourself in the home. Can I, will I let my children say to me, mom, you think you need a timeout here? It takes a little bit of humility to do that, doesn't it? But the, but the um, role modeling of it is powerful, isn't it? So what I recommend if you're having an argument is to try saying, could we have a timeout right now? You set the timer for five minutes, because you can't go away and not talk about it anymore. I'm not asking you to all run away from problems. 
I'm asking for you to cool down and have more calm conversations about things that are difficult that you have to do. And so if you can make a family rule that we're going to call a timeout when somebody's escalating in their behavior so that everybody can do whatever it is they're going to do. So you're going to do your positive imagery. You're going to do your three deep breaths. You get to be in control of you. But we're not going to talk to each other for five minutes. Um, I tried this out in the car with my kids when they were still teenagers. They're all adults now, so I'm, I'm remembering back to when I still drove a minivan. Um, and uh, um, I moved into a Mini Cooper just so I could not have to move college children's mattresses anymore, actually. But when I had a minivan, when I had a minivan and the kids were doing something that was ticking me off, um, for the oomph time, I would just become silent. Um, uh, and uh, in the back seat behind me would be children saying something like, mom's not talking to us. What happened? Like, there's no plexiglass between us. I hear everything they're saying, of course. Mom's not talking to us. What happened? You ask her. I'm not asking her. You ask her. What'd you do? I didn't do anything. You, you, she did it. You know, and there would be this whole skirmish in the back seat that would be hilarious. And I wish I had ever videotaped it, because really, this repeated itself over and over and over again, till they got the idea that, oh, she's cooling down. And so sometimes I didn't even announce I was doing a cool down. I just thought if I spoke one more word, it was going to be in, in a shout. And I needed to you know, not demonstrate that shouting was the right way to resolve problems, um, even though it's my instinct to do that. Um, and, and so I want everybody to think about what is your in the moment thing you're going to try. And, and so the, the, the choices I gave you were three deep breaths, positive imagery, reciting some um, uh, mantra, um, prayer, some other kind of mindfulness ex ex exercise. Pick one of those or one that is similar. And then decide how often are you going to try to do it to imprint it. So I would suggest that twice a day is not a bad idea, because these, all of these activities are meant to happen in under a minute. You know, How long does it take you to take three deep breaths? 40 seconds, probably. So doing this a couple of times in the day, out of habit, and checking it off some way, or, or making an announcement that we're doing it together. In the car is a great place for some of this stuff, because you're, you know, you're trapped together um, in, in a different way. Um, and so try to make yourself a promise of this one thing you're going to try to do. Then let's think about what you can do if you have a little more time. So the stretching works better for the little bit more time, right? I can excuse myself. What else do people do when you have a little more time to manage your stress? Walk. Is that what somebody said? Walk. Yeah, walk is good. I, I learned to walk out the door of the hospital and in a different door. Like I just walk out the front door and in the side door, and I'm outside in the world, and I can't hear anything that's happening in there for 20 seconds or two minutes. It's a nice method. I particularly like to wash my face. You know, there's something actually physiologic about cool water on your face that does calm you. And so that works for me. Um, it doesn't work for the fact that my mother would like me to wear more makeup so I would be a finished professional, that I have to wash my face a lot in the day. But um, nonetheless, it's, it's an option. What else could you do if you have a few minutes, if you can get up and move away from whatever you're doing? Surely you have more. Just go to a different room. Change the scene. Good. What else? Color, right. Color's great. Angie. Yoga, Yoga so nice stretching. Mm -hmm. awesome. Homework, OK. I, that's relaxing for you? Are you sure that's relaxing for you and it doesn't make, it's not too, as long as it's fun homework. It's actually important, because some people will say, listen to a song at this point. And if the song you're listening to is heavy metal or crass rap, um, that's not relaxing. And so you actually have to pick the music that is relaxing. What you're trying to do is bring your heart rate down, de-escalate the, the steroid cortisol that's storming through your body. So to do that, you need to find something that works for you. Practicing what song might work for me and then using that song as your cool down music is, is a good idea. But, but you do need to be careful that it's not something that has a real you know, uh, st staplosive beat and uh, uh, um, lyrics that make you want to hurt somebody. Um, uh, what else can you do? 
So we're going to pick a song, we're going to take a walk, we're going to wash our faces, go to the bathroom, just works in the same way as wash your face, wash your face, wash your hands, I don't care what you wash. Um, so seek joy, uh, and a lot of people use imagery in this, in the, for this as well, right? They just look for a, a memory to relive, right? Like think of, I'm a beach bunny, right? Like I want to lay in the sun, hear the waves, smell the ocean, right? Like that, if I can get into that with all my senses for three minutes, my heart rate slows. I feel better. All of these exercises, it's really important for you to hear, don't in fact make the stressor go away. They just take you from here, where you're too escalated to deal with it sanely, to here, where, okay, now I have a little bit more control of my faculties and I'm going to be able to address it. And this is the same for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're the caregiver or an individual with learning differences. Anybody have any other ones they use for if you got five minutes? Let, so video clips, so it's very interesting to think about this and what it can do good for us or bad for us. I, I have mixed feelings, right, about it. And cat, kittens, you know, kittens and puppy videos, a lot of people say too. And so I, I think that works as long as you don't remember that maybe I should go over to Candy Crush um, while you're doing it, right? Because Candy Crush just drains your brain, I think. I think, I really think it does. Um, Yeah, you get sucked in in a way, it, it's, it's so addicting that I think we, have, we just have to be mindful that are we really doing it for the two minutes we need to de-escalate or then do we get sucked in and are we doing it in a way that is a time sink and or we see other videos that aren't as positive then. You know, so it, there's, there's probably too much here offered and if you can go directly just to your um, your laughing baby videos, it's better than if you have to go past your email and see that there are 20 waiting there for you and the other things you get to see when you open this. So I think that's the distractant that happens here. And so if you have a direct button to those things, it's better. I, I actually like Breathe to Relax, free app, that um, shows you this very nice um, scene with um, white noise and it actually helps you, you set the time period of what your inh inhalations and expirations are and it kind of coaches you through some deep breaths visually. And so, so I think there are apps you can use, but, but you have to just be cautious of all the other stuff that's floating on this machine, right? Anybody have anything else? Sing. Absolutely, yes. Yep, so silence. Five minutes of silence. Anybody have anything else? Five minute activities. I learned, <laughs> Now, 15 years ago, that if I read medical journals before I go to bed, I have nightmares. And if I read poetry or um, uh, a light novel that isn't a spy thriller or something else that sets my mind in a, on a different tone, I have better sleep. It took me till into my 40s to figure this out. You know, and now if I, do, if I read a journal before I go to bed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wake up having a nightmare that your potassium is off. <laughs> I am. I don't know why potassium is very important in my, my mind, but it is. That's what I have nightmares about when I read medical journals. Um, and, and, or, or your anticoagulant levels off. Like, those are the two that really wake me up. Um, uh, uh, and, and so thinking about how you use reading can do it. I don't think television does it. I'm not exactly sure why I understand this. I wonder, is there somebody smarter in the room or any of the other therapists still here? That, that television is so passive that I don't think it actually engages your brain in this different way to relax. And, and so it is, it's mindless, not relaxing. And they're not the same. There has to be some active work in the brain, I think, to really get to relax. Um, Sudoku, um, uh, other kinds of puzzles like that can help as long as they're not ones that's, that you're addicted to, right? And that sucker you in in that other way. So those are good, those are good five minute activities. What are you gonna do preventative now to help manage your stress? So, that's the, so we talked about in the moment, if you got five minutes, and now you got, you got life. How, what are you gonna do? You got your real life, which isn't all the freedom in the world. Sleep, so make sure you have good sleep hygiene. Incredibly important. 
behavior is so linked to sleep in all of us that we shouldn't ever underplay it. What else? Eat healthy. So I, I, fast sugar doesn't make us feel good. Um, I, I, we need carbohydrates. I mean, we need them nutritionally. But junk food really, really doesn't make your body feel good. It feels we connect it with love in this interesting way, but it's not loving on the body. Yeah. So feeding your soul in some manner, whatever your soul needs. So that might be a hike in nature. That might be a spiritual ritual. That might be um, a, a good exercise workout. Lots of people exercise. I, I, I love to pull weeds, as long as there's no poison ivory around, because that does me in every time. Um, uh, but, uh, but so knowing what your thing is and doing it in some habituated manner is also important. I think the things you're doing to take better care of yourselves probably have to, and, and I'm talking about everybody, not just caregivers and not just persons with Down syndrome, right? You got to do things at least three times a week, I think, for them to have the chance of helping you. And so if you only get to remember doing something once every month, you're going to have to think about how else am I going to step that up so it is actually making my body better. Sleeping well once a month doesn't make anybody better. Exercising once a month might be fun, but does it make you conditioned? So I think you have to think about those things in that manner. Using prayer only in crisis probably doesn't make prayer work for you. So using your body physically can happen in lots of different ways. We didn't used to belong to gyms 500 years ago, right? You just kneaded the bread um, and, and put it in the oven, and that was a good workout. Um, and so I think you can think about that in a lot of different ways. I'm never going to be a runner. I, in fact, hate running. Um, but uh, give me a swimming pool, and I'm, I, I can beat at that water and feel really good about it. Anybody else got any other ones they want to share? All right, so that was the crux of what I wanted to talk about, about what is stress and how can we think about how we deal with stress in our lives. I'm going to talk now a little bit about more about challenging behaviors for about 15 minutes. I want to remind us what other resources there are besides ourselves for persons with Down syndrome. So I think that the, all of these therapies are stress management te techniques. And so if you have a waiver and don't know how to use it, and the person's having trouble with stress, these things do it. When it's the right fit for that person. I don't mean that you're dragging them by their heels with their head bumping down the stairs. Uh, but but you know, figuring out which of these actually work. Recognizing how to use mental health services. We didn't talk about talking to someone as a stress reducer. And so we left out an important thing. Because calling up your best friend and just talking about it is a stress reducer. Not if you're just whining. But if, but if that person's empathizing and being there for you, that helps you not feel alone in the world, right? And so um, counseling is a very important stress manager, whether that's formally paid for counseling, or friend to friend counseling, or minister to person counseling, or lots of other ways that that happens, right? Um, There are issues with accessing mental health services for people with intellectual disabilities in our state currently. I, I get bet you're all surprised I just said that because you didn't know. But, um, uh, but I want to make sure that everybody knows there's many layers of help. There is, and I want you to think of the triad of behavioral therapies and other therapies through your waiver services, as well as counseling, as well as psychiatric services. And they, they come through two different pathways in our payer system currently. So it's confusing to think about all three of them together as things that help with mental health and behavioral health. But you should think of them together. The other thing I want to, now that I've worked on calming you, rile you up a little bit, 
um, uh, in that I think currently um, the way we provide mental health services for persons with intellectual disabilities is a violation of the federal law. Um, because we let places say we don't do pe we don't care for people with intellectual disabilities, and I think I want to activate all of you to recognize that's an ADA violation, and just saying we have nobody that does that. That's the same as saying we have nobody who can si sign for us, and so if you're deaf, we're not going to counsel you, or if we don't have we don't have a ramp, so if you're in a wheelchair, we're not going to counsel you. It's the same, and so we have to actually react against that and say no, sorry, I I need you to do this, and. I think we're going to need to have a class action suit about it, quite honestly. Um, I didn't bring a petition with me, but maybe next time. Um, uh, because it is a serious problem today in our state to get the services you want. A and it's not as bad in the denser urban areas as it is in the semi-urban and rural areas. It's abominable there, um, but it's still hard here. And I, and I think we all have to be, as an organization that has some um, act. Um, advocacy role. I think this is a big issue currently, not just in Indiana, unfortunately, but it's a real issue. Okay, get off that soft soapbox, Mary. Um, uh, so I already told you, challenging behaviors is it does isn't just because you have Down syndrome. Challenging behaviors don't happen just because you have autism. All of us have challenging behaviors sometimes, and what a challenging behavior is is using the wrong coping strategy. That's what it is. You're trying to cope and you're doing it the wrong way. And maybe you don't have the way to express it, but you're just doing it the wrong way, right? It's not, it, it might be getting you what you want, but it isn't something that the world is going to tolerate from you um, um, uh, in an ongoing manner. And you've already, so when I think about challenging behaviors, I think about environment, physical health, and mental health in those three groupings. Um, and environment, I think about what's happening at school and, or work and in the home and in the community environment and what's happening in terms of significant life events. A le an important lesson I've learned is significant life events don't have to be significant to my interpretation, just have to be significant to the person's interpretation. So if this person sat next to me in my resource room for the last six years and now they're gone, that might be super significant to a person, whereas we don't even know that happened because we don't pay attention to who sits next to them every day um, you know, in their all-day school activity. Um, uh, significant might be the loss of a pet. And we think, you know, you know, you really weren't attached to that pet. But that might be significant, right? So, so sometimes it takes a little work when we're coming into a behavioral therapist or a mental health counselor, and they want to know what the antecedent of the ABC was. Sometimes we have trouble figuring that out. So I'm going to give you a list of some questions to ask yourself as you're trying to figure out what could be the trigger here. We talked already that certainly communication issues are an issue often in the environment that causes problems, right? If the, the person can't be understood, then their need and want can't be adequately responded to. Um, and then life stages is important, and I mentioned that already. Three-year-olds are different than 23-year-olds with IQs of 55. They're not the same. Um, so when I think about life changes and problems, I'm going to show you some questions. Then I think about mental illness as often being at least 20 to 30 percent of issues in people's um, uh, changes in behavior. And then I think about this group of uh, physical uh, conditions in Down syndrome that I'm going to run through one by one. So here's the list of questions, and I think Stephanie, you'll be able to make you're going to make these available, right? The the presentations, right? Or they'll be in the webinar, so people can look at them that way. Because I don't want to walk through all of these, but it is important when you're thinking about what could be triggering a person to think about the list of things of has he been getting adequate sleep? Has his meals been has he been eaten? All different kinds of foods. Vitamin D deficiency from never being in the sun and never eating any source of vitamin D makes you hurt in a way that you might not think about, right? But it makes your bones ache. And so if your vitamin D level is 5 and it's supposed to be over 30, you might be grumpy just because you ache all over. And if we don't think about that in terms of thinking about people's good nutrition, then, then it's, it's an area of uh, um, uh, reckoning. Um, thinking about the temporal way things happen. If it, there's a cycle to it, or it, or it happens on certain days of the week. Thinking about 
who does what when this happens. You've already heard that explained to you in a very good way in previous talks today, so I won't talk about that much. Um, uh, and, and what things you do to reinforce or extinguish. So let's go to the medical stuff in particular. Pain that we don't, pain that we can't see. Medical conditions that we haven't remembered to check for. And medication effect. Cyclical symptoms, people who sleep very different during the school week um, and than they do on the weekends, often makes Monday hard. It's not just about that I didn't go to school yesterday, but it might also be that I'm behind six hours in my sleep need um, come Monday morning. Um, cyclical things like uh, menstrual periods. People, um, a cyclical behavioral um, a disorder just from menstruation is well described in persons with learning differences. Uh, things like an ear infection might make you really not like the sound of uh, loud noises in the room, even when usually loud noises are fit to you. Um, hitting your head when your sinuses hurt might be something you do when you're also upset, but thinking about whether your sinuses are hurting because that's why you're hitting here. P there, it's so diverse how people express their pain in the community of individuals with intellectual disabilities that this slide isn't something I want to walk through in a scientific manner. I just wanted to express how varied people are. Because some people vocalize and some people change their social behaviors and some people you can see it in their face and other people just look blotchy or sweaty and other people get tight and other people go limp and um, other people pace more when they feel bad or stand completely motionless. And so all of this is meant to say that you have to know your person. I like a tool that I forgot to put in as a slide. It's called the DISDAT tool. It's the Disability Distress Assessment Tool, D-I-S-D-A-T. And it, it, it encourages you, particularly for persons who are very limited in their verbal expression, to think about what they look like when they're happy as a clam. I don't know why clams are happy. When they're happy as a clam, and um, versus, um, I don't think they have a, a central nervous system and have the capacity for this. I'm, uh, yeah, this, all right, that was stupid. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and when they're stressed. And what that looks like in this person and how to express that to the whole world that works with that person. Because it's so individual is the point I want to make here. So what kind of things make you irritated? Allergies. If you have phlegm going down the back of your throat and your eyes are itching like crazy. Um, sinus infections and ear infections that are often related to allergies, headaches for a variety of reasons, menstrual cramps, not good enough dental care, big issue, right? Um, uh, puffy, bleeding gums hurt. No vitamin C in your life is a cause of puffy, bleeding gums. So the kids who never get any vegetables and fruit in their world, so no tomatoes, no citrus, hard to get enough vitamin C in them. And that can just make your teeth hurt. Um, uh, sleep disturbance is huge. Um, humans commonly have heartburn. How do you express heartburn if you don't have good verbal communication? Sometimes I just randomly try to treat heartburn for a week or so and see if that makes everything better, since I know that 30 to 40 percent of people have heartburn sometimes. There's I'm not prescribing anything from this podium, but you know, a trial of a little antacid now and again isn't a bad thing as long as that person doesn't have a reason they can't take them, and that requires you asking somebody explicitly that. Loss of hearing changes behavior. We know about the huge hearing loss problem in Down syndrome in adults. So, so you're going to be more stressed if all of a sudden your sensory intake is completely done or, or markedly reduced, not being able to see similarly. It's scary to walk down stairs when you can't see. It causes anxiety, in fact, when you've lost depth perception because of your keratoconus. Andy. So that's to help you hear better, to try and prevent this problem. Keep up the good work. Um, Seizure, oh, constipation, again, can't talk about it. Can't, I can't talk to people who work with people with intellectual disabilities without talking about constipation because it is a substantive cause of pain. If you poop rocks that won't flush, you do not have a normal colon and it hurts. 
We're done with that for today. Um, thyroid disease, very common. Thyroid disease doesn't look like the textbook of everybody else when you have Down syndrome with it. You might slow down. You might not tolerate temperature. Your skin might be even drier than it was before because it's dry all the time with Down syndrome. You might be more constipated. I guess I was going to mention that again. You might be tired. Your weight might be not, um, uh, uh, might be raising up, or you might just have a depressed affect. We, I think I said enough about GI already, except I want to throw in celiac. Celiac doesn't happen all, like, celiac isn't the same order of magnitude as hearing loss and constipation, right? Hearing loss and constipation and Down syndrome, celiac. And people talk about celiac a lot, and that's why I want to make that difference. So it matters if you have celiac, but just because you have antibodies doesn't mean you have celiac. And it, can, it is a cause of fatigue and change in affect. But um, I, I recommend that people are careful about jumping the gun on that. The incidence of celiac is under 5% in this population, whereas I just told you 80% have constipation. We talked about sleep disruption already, but I, it's critical. Sleep apnea, again, right behind constipation, is the frequency of sleep apnea. If you can't get good restorative sleep, which is exactly what obstructive sleep apnea does to you, then you can't feel good the next day. Um, and uh, at, on the same hand, using CPAP when it's a major life skirmish to get somebody to do that and causing more stress in everybody's life isn't always the right solution. So there has to be a way of negotiating and figuring out why we're going to do this versus that um, if you are a person with obstructive sleep apnea. We talked about vision and hearing loss. I talked about menstrual um, related behavior changes. Um, seizures, um, interestingly, People who are on a lot of meds that sedate them, when we pull them back off of that and they're less sedated, sometimes have more behavioral manifestations because it was masked by their sedation before. Um, and so sometimes there's actually a release phenomena when your seizures are better controlled and you're not always stunned from seizing, or we've changed the sedating medicines and all of a sudden you're activated because you're not as sedated. And so um, uh, the classic example in the typical population is people who are alcoholics when they stop their alcohol, they, all, they have to confront their emotional and mental health problems that they were self-medicating as it was, right? And, and they're like, I just got this from this. I'm like, no, you didn't just get this from this. You got this, you had this all along, you were just masking it. And so meds do that in a variety of ways in Down syndrome as well. I just want to say out loud that you're never going to see Alzheimer's disease in 20-year-olds with, with Down syndrome. I'm going to say this one more time. You're never going to see Alzheimer's disease in 20-year-olds with Down syndrome. Because everybody knows there's a lot of Alzheimer's in this population. There is this knee-jerk run to it to make the diagnosis too soon. And if somebody's telling you that a 27-year-old has Alzheimer's, go to a different person, because they're wrong. Now, how often do you see it in 30-year-olds? Almost never. So be careful about getting trapped into this. If the person has never cared for per a person with intellectual disabilities with Alzheimer's, then they can't screen the same way you screen a neurotypical person. So this person can't read. They must have Alzheimer's. Well, they never could read. Well, it's ridiculous. And, but that is the kind of testing that sometimes gets done as, as out outrageous as that is. So just be careful about this. There are tools that are specific to people with learning disabilities for Alzheimer's that have been used in the literature for a long time but there's not good general usage yet out in the community with people who are just experts in Alzheimer's, not Alzheimer's with intellectual disabilities. Um, the issue with mental illness in this population is that there's, you have to remember to think about adjustment disorders, meaning that this behavior looks like mental illness, but it's about the environment, right? So if you're, if you're acutely bereaved, if you've just lost, you've had someone die in your life, um, we often don't afford persons with limited communication the ability to feel substantive grief and have that completely change their functional ability. You know, when, when my mom died, my functional ability was pretty changed for a couple of weeks. And, and when I'm honest with you, for probably a year subsequent as well. And so, um, so how do we afford that 
to individuals who can't tell us that's the issue, that they just feel really sad about this person who's not here right now. Thinking about how to afford people the ability to grieve when they can't verbally do so. So how do we do positive memories of the person? How do we use pictures to help us remember them? How do we do things that aren't plucking at the nerve, but helping the person process through? Um, no patients read the textbook before they manifest with illnesses. And this is particularly true for people with Down syndrome, that they don't know the rules of what, de what depression is supposed to look like. And so atypical presentations are typical <laughs> in this population. And so I think that's an, another important part of thinking about how do we make diagnoses. I want you to be afraid of medicines for just stopping behaviors. I don't want you to be afraid of medicines that are treating a distinct diagnosis. They're very different. So antipsychotics, so you stop biting. That's, that's like, I don't know how to calm you down, so I'm going to sedate you with the drug. Now, should I tell you I never do that? No, I don't never do that, but I try to do that really, really left. But antidepressants or anti anxietals for real depression and real anxiety work. So I want you to get the difference. All of these things happen in Down syndrome. Depression is the most common um, mental health disorder of, um, uh, of uh, persons with Down syndrome. Anxieties and phobias are also particularly common. They're more common, interestingly, in people who are more mildly affected from an IQ perspective than people more profoundly affected, which is interesting. Um, uh, obsessive compulsive ritualistic behaviors, conduct disorders, attention, dis attention deficit happens um, regularly and is a secondary condition. It isn't part of Down syndrome. It's another diagnosable condition that's treatable. And then, then there's a subset of folks with uh, uh, um, Down syndrome who have autism as well. Um, Self-talk. Who doesn't talk to themselves here? You all talk to yourselves. You might not move your lips when you do it, but you all talk to yourselves. For better or worse, one of the joys of Down syndrome is that when most folks with Down syndrome talk to themselves, they move their lips. It's the only difference. Um, and so don't, I have had a lot of people present to me as if they think their person is hallucinating because they talk to themselves. If you have a pattern of when you're stressed, you talk to yourself more, I do that. On a bad day at work, am I like blah, 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 in the car driving home? I sure am. I'm reliving the whole thing. I'm playing the tape over and over again. And what could I have said differently? Because that certainly didn't go the way I wanted it to. And my voice is escalating and it's going faster. I'm just not moving my lips, right? Persons with Down syndrome tend to move their lips when they're doing all that mental gymnastics. Now, I find that useful for families because you can actually listen and hear, hear the whole tape rewind, reround. And you can hear, like, don't do that. Stop it. Why are you putting your hands there? Don't do that. Stop it, right? And you should go, OK, who's putting the hands where? And why, why do we want them to stop it, right? You can, you can use it to help you. Um, I think I'm getting short on time. I am short on time. OK, let's just go to this. So in thinking about how to address challenging behaviors, I like this three-level approach. And the first thing is the prevention. So the first thing is positive relationships, supportive environments, and healthy bodies. Anybody want to argue with that? Like, it's just basic 101, right? If we're not doing this first, doing all the other stuff isn't going to help. If you hurt because you don't eat healthy, all the counseling in the world isn't going to make you less grumpy. Then step two is to work on social and communication competencies that work for the problem behavior, not fuel it, right? So we heard a lot about that already. And then third, an intensive program of some sort is that highest level of the pyramid. Everybody doesn't need that. Everybody needs the bottom of the base of the pyramid, though. So what's in the base of the pyramid? Eat healthy, hydrate. I can't talk about hydration enough. If you're not good at monitoring your own body's physiologic cues, like right now you're a little thirsty, then you need someone else to say to you, you need to drink eight, hours, eight glasses of liquid a day, and you haven't drank in a while, so here's one. So you need to make habits, because chronic dehydration is very common in the population of people with intellectual disabilities. Be active so the motor works well. Keep your body clean, sleep enough, have stress management strategies for brief, Longer and preventive reasons, take care of your external body, go for checkups regularly. Check your hearing, check your vision, 
go to the dentist, all of those things as common causes of problems. I love this study. This was a study of, this was a, a consolidated study of 20 different studies that showed getting people up and moving them who were having problems with challenging behavior, regardless of the cause of the challenging behavior, improved a huge portion of people. Doesn't have to be high intensity mini marathon running. Get up and move. My, my prescription commonly is dance to three songs in a row. Get up and move and dance to three songs in a row. Almost everybody finds some joy in that, but they're also physically using their body and it helps. Um, it, it's measured to help. I already said the things I like to say about drugs, but I'll say them one more time. Be careful. Go slow. Go low. Go start low. Go slow. Have an exit plan. That doesn't mean that you start a medicine and you decide it doesn't work after two days, because most of most psychiatric meds take a month to know if they work. So when I say go slow, I try not to rev anything faster than a month. Um, if you're on something and it's working, don't say, now we fixed it and we can stop the medicine. So if you've figured out that there is depression, then you probably want to treat it for six to 12 months, not for, not for three weeks, not till just the symptoms look better. That doesn't mean you've fixed it yet. That means you've controlled it, but you're still in a necessary longitudinal period of management. All right, so what are you going to pick to try? What are your goals? You're going to practice some habits of brief interventions. You're going to work on healthier lifestyles. You're going to engage some supports that exist. What do you want to do, Angie? Pick one thing. You're going to swim. Meet you at the pool. All right, you don't have to tell me what you're going to do, but I want you to make a promise to yourself of one thing you're going to try that made you go, huh, when somebody was talking today. It doesn't have to be what I said. And now I'll be happy to answer any questions. That's how to do that. In your folder, you all have brochures for uh, Dr. Kibrilla's kayak clinic in there. So that's in the left hand pocket. Um, we're working on improving our state's health care for adults with intellectual disability. We're actually actively working on creating that. I'm funded at Kayak to take care of people 11 to 22. Um, my oldest patient is. No, I don't, you say that, Rich, lie. I don't say lie, but I just say, just call. Just call. Well, um, there aren't resources to find. The, the um, Down syndrome uh, or the N NDSS has a list of people who say they take care of uh, people with Down syndrome, but the only people who say that in this state are us, who are posted on that site. So there, I don't think you have to be a specialist in Down syndrome to be a primary care doctor for Down syndrome if your family is an activated consumer. And so, um, so I think any good primary care doc can help you, just then has to figure out what's within their scope of practice that they're comfortable doing in-house, or how to get the outhouse, not outhouse. <laughs> There's my poop joke for the day. Um, uh, but out of house um, uh, um, services that you need. We work hard at Kayak to support primary care practices by giving them information and kind of getting their backs when they, because we don't keep people, because we are a, um, we'd be closed to new patients if we kept people, right? So we see them as consultation, in consultation, set them up with their primary care doc with the information we think that person needs and says, call us, and then says, say, call us for anything. Only if you have a need. Not, not just because we exist, but if you have a need. We're only funded to see people up to age 22 by the State Department of Health. Um, and we're trying to work on that. But, 
but I whispered that our oldest patient was 68. So I'm not supposed to be seeing them, but if I can't find somebody else to do it, I see them. Yeah. That one? Mm -hmm. All right, out of questions? That's the heartburn. Yeah, heartburn's really common in the, in the adult human population. The chubby you are, you are, the more likely you have it. So I use a lot of um, trials of Prilosec um, and drugs like that, omeprazole. Um, and if I use it for a month and the person's behaviors melt, and then I take it away and the behavior comes back, I know they were having heartburn even though they couldn't tell me. So I, that's, that's a fairly crude experiment, but it works for me to do it that way. A throat clearing thing is, an, is a commonly, uh, is commonly reflex symptoms too. Yeah. And I try not to do an endoscopy in everybody that I want to do this on because endoscopies take anesthesia and I try and avoid an anesthesia whenever possible. So that's why I do trials of antacids or Zantac or omeprazole or those kind of drugs. Not for years, mind you, because you shouldn't be on them for years without knowing what you're treating. But it's a, something I try in a lot of patients because of this frequency. Do you mean augmentative communication therapy or garden variety speech therapy? Um, does he not, is he not verbal? He's garbled or he doesn't, can't find words. So can't find words, then pictures help or other devices help. Garbled, it's hard to correct because that's about oral motor tone and we don't have a, you know, that's, that's harder to fix. But you don't want garden variety um, speech therapy. You want people who are experts then in augmentative communication. There, it, you know, there are different kinds of everything, right? You know, there's, there's ABA be, be, behavioral therapy and then there's, you know, functional behavioral analysis folks and they're, they're not always the same. Um, the um, oral motor dysfunction from hypotonia and mid-face hypoplasia. So um, in the development of Down syndrome, folks' passages all in through here tend to be very small, and the tongue is often large. But the tone is also low. So if you're low tone and you try to talk, it comes down. Right? That's, that's low tone talk, not just big tongue. So um, I'm, I'm a nihilist about surgeries. Other people are more aggressive of that than me, but I'm, I'm kind of a nihilist about big surgeries. I don't think that, I think we're all capable of learning um, if the person is using the right techniques to teach it for that person. So there are things to practice, sometimes pacing, so for individuals who are hard to understand, sometimes just slowing them down helps them be, have more clarity, right? And that might be what you focus on rather than believing at an older age you're going to strengthen the muscles of the pharynx. Um, there, um, at uh, Riley and at Crossroads, there are great OGCOM speech therapists in general. The garden variety speech therapist at a small community hospital is more going to be a person who's used to working with a lot of people with strokes, and so they have different skill sets. <laughs>